Good morning. It's always a joy for Judy and me to be here today uh, with you to bring uh, God's word to you. Special greeting to those who might be online or staying home and watching uh, this message as well. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today I'm going to be reading to you from Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 17 to 32. Acts 20. 17 to 32. Just to give you a little background, Paul is now on his third missionary journey. And so in verse 17, it says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound in the spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among you which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the word of your grace. Thank you that we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not of ourselves. For it is the, your gift given to us that we might walk in it. Father, thank you for your spirit that lives within us and empowers us to holy living. May your spirit energize us today as we open up your word, that it would be the whole truth and nothing but the truth. All to your praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said earlier, Paul was on his third missionary journey. When you may remember, he got long-winded and on one Sunday kept preaching until midnight when a young man named Eutychus, whose name means fortunate, was very fortunate to be alive when he fell asleep from a third floor window and fell out of it down to the ground and according to Dr. Luke was picked up dead. The good doctor then reported, but Paul went down and fell upon him, perhaps a form of CPR like the prophets of old, and after embracing him said, do not be troubled for his life is in him. And then get this, we read, when he, that is Paul, had gone back up, that is to the third floor again, Luke records they broke bread or had communion, and Paul talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. Ho-hum, just another day and night in the life of Paul, which brings us to today's text. Dr. Luke tells us that Paul and his companions had sailed to Miletus, 
which was a port on the southwest coast of Asia Minor, 36 miles south of Ephesus. And from there we are told he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Now keep in mind back then they didn't have cars or Ubers to get them quickly from one place to another. Now some of you know that I get up early in the morning and after my devotional time, I go out, Lord willing, for a 2.1 mile walk around the neighborhood at a pace of about four miles an hour. And so I figured that at my pace, it would take the Ephesian elders perhaps about nine hours to get where Paul was. But I am sure seeing Paul one more time would have been well worth the walk as we shall see. Paul had been with the Ephesians before, as Dr. Luke tells us in Acts 18, verses 18 through 21, where we read, Paul, having remained many days longer, that is, in Corinth, took leave of the brethren there and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sencria, Dr. Luke records that Paul had his hair cut for keeping a vow, which, according to Dr. Charles Ryrie, was the conclusion of a Nazarite vow, which if you're interested, you can read about in Numbers chapter six, verse 18. Well, then Dr. Luke continued, they, that is Paul, Priscilla and Aquila came to Ephesus and he left them there, that is Priscilla and Aquila. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills he set sail from Ephesus. Now that made me think of the expression, if God wills or Lord willing, which sadly is one of those biblical expressions we don't hear much about these days, even among Christians. James, the half brother of Jesus wrote about this in James four verses 13 and 15 saying, come now you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Just think about that, how we just take life for granted. We expect there will be a, a tomorrow but the word of God says, you don't even know if you have tomorrow, all that you have is today. And so as a result of that, today is all that we have. Because we know from one season to the next, things happen, people live, people die, people go home to be with the Lord, or they go to the prospect of hell for eternity. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't think much about eternity, but I should, and we should. Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I mean, just think about that. We have eternal life. We will live with the Lord Jesus Christ for eternity. Now it's interesting because oftentimes we think about living with mom or dad or living with spouse, maybe even living with the grandparents or our family and friends. But do we think about an eternity with Christ? I mean, we should be excited about that. Every day we should be excited about that. Even from moment to moment, we ought to be excited about that. But why is it that we aren't? Well, I like to think it's probably because we have too much of the world in us. We're citizens of TV and the computer and other things that distract us from thinking about an eternity with Christ and then making each day count for eternity. The Apostle Paul was really into his life uh, in Christ and we have much to learn from him. And so as we continue our story, we see it was the Lord's will for Paul to visit Ephesus again, which Luke records in Acts chapter 19, one, where the good doctor, doctor reported, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, 
Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus where he found some disciples. Now, I thought that was kind of interesting where Paul found some disciples. I don't know about you, but it's somewhat encouraging that back then, being a Christian often seemed like it was in the minority, just like it is today. I mean, if you think about that, and you take a look at all the people that you know, think about how many of them are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The majority of them would be unbelievers. But that's the way it's always been. I mean, if you go back to Genesis and read all the way through, we are always in the minority. Matter of fact, in, in the Old Testament, and, and this just shows God's love for the Jewish people, he could have just destroyed them numerous times and wiped them out as a people group. But what did he do? He always preserved a remnant. And even today, I, I, I think about us as Christians that we are kind of like a remnant. I mean, just think about all the people that call themselves Christians. But are they really Christians? And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. It's interesting that when Paul would go into a city, even though he was the apostle to the Gentiles, where would he go first? To the synagogue. He's had such a heart for the Jewish people. Now, I don't know if God had to keep reminding him that or not, but it's interesting, whenever he went into a Gentile city, he'd go right to the synagogue because he had a heart for the Jews. He had a heart for lost people. Do we have a heart for lost people? Do we really care that people are going to hell for eternity? We should. Then why is it so difficult for us to witness to them? Well, because we expect that they're going to respond to the message. But then again, if you go cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, the minority of people responded to the good news of the gospel. They wanted the good news of the world. Well, is it any different today? Watch the news. Pay attention to what's going on. Do you really hear a lot about Jesus? Jesus really doesn't even make the news at all, does he? But the interesting thing about it is, as it has been from the garden to the present day, after the fall, the majority of people will reject God, will reject Jesus, will reject the good news of salvation for kind of what I call a hope so. I hope it'll get better. I'm praying it'll get better. But then again, what is it? It's all about me. Roger, that was great when you personalized the Psalm 23. It's not about us. The Lord is our shepherd. He takes care of all of our needs. Sometimes we get a little greedy and we want more than just our needs. But see, that's when we become too worldly and not godly, like the way that he wants us to be. Let me read to you from verses 8 and 9. Oops. I have to just take a look to see where I am here. Hang on. Well, I had already read verses 8 through 9 at the beginning, so let me just give you some exposition on that. Keep in mind that Paul was sent by the Lord Jesus in Acts 9.15. This is what we were talking about as the apostle to the Gentiles. But he had a heart for lost people. He had a heart especially for uh, his fellow Jews. He wanted them to be saved. He wanted them to have the eternal life that he had. That should be our mindset and our heart set as well. In verses 11 and 12, we learn that God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. 
so that the handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried out from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. Now, I don't know about you, that was pretty spectacular. Now, the interesting thing about it is, and you don't hear anything about people sending out handkerchiefs these days, other than amongst the prosperity preachers. They say, hey, send us some money. We'll send you a handkerchief. We'll send you another piece of clothing or whatever that has been anointed, that has been touched by God and blessed by God, and you'll be able to do miracles too. Now again, isn't that just exactly what we want? We want to see miracles. We even want to do miracles. And God has allowed some to do that. And I know in my 40 plus years of ministry, I've seen miracles. I've seen God literally raise people from the dead. But does that happen all the time? Does that happen in every situation according to every prayer that we pray? No. Ultimately, people die. But that's God's will. We had a dear friend of ours. We've known her for almost 40 years, and she just went home to be with the Lord just the other day. We had a memorial service on, for her on Friday, and what a time of worship and celebration that was. Yes, there were tears shed, but the glory of the Lord shone through her, and she was a special person in our lives and in the life of the church uh, where we served. And we look forward to seeing her again, healthy and whole. I mean, isn't that exciting to think about healthy and whole for eternity? Instead of sickly and decaying in this particular world in which we live? I like what Paul says, outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Well, how, how come we don't feel that way? How come we don't feel like we're being renewed day by day? Well, because we're not as in love with Jesus as we ought to be. We're too much in love with this world and the things of this world rather than Jesus. But the Apostle Paul was so in love with Jesus that it, it just radiated out of his personality. And if you go through, I think it's in 2 Corinthians there, this long list of sufferings that Paul went through, it was just amazing that he could still have the joy. But back in Nehemiah, he wrote, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Wow. No wonder we just kind of flail around in this life because we don't have the joy of the Lord to be our strength. We're relying upon maybe Dr. Fauci or we're relying upon, you know, our favorite movie star or athlete to be our joy and our strength. I mean, I'll ask you a question and you don't have to respond, you know, right now, but I mean, how many of you have the joy of the Lord because the Packers lost? <laughs> or were you crushed and angry? Well, I'm the same way when that happens to my team as well. But I'm thankful that God has taught me that over the years that it's not about Tom Brady. It's not about Aaron Rodgers. It's about Jesus. Oh, yeah, you can watch the game and you can get excited or whatever, but leave it there and get excited about Jesus. And again, I'm not only preaching to the choir, but I'm preaching to myself as well as I'm going along here. You know, it's interesting that Paul was calling, or Paul's calling in ministry was to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I know of other so-called Christians who can check all the boxes. They'll say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. 
I believe that he was buried. I believe that he was raised from the dead. But then they go on to say, but I know that I have to keep doing all kinds of good works for Jesus so that I can keep being saved and maybe go to heaven someday. Maybe some of you have come out of a false gospel like that. Or you know of a lot of people that still are in a false gospel like that. And, and I've often asked some of these people, and I say, do you know that if you were to die today that you would be 100% sure that you would go to heaven? And what do they say? I hope so. Wow. I don't know about you, but I know so. Amen? Amen. We're 100% sure. Why? Because the Bible tells us so. God told us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from your sins and you will have eternal life. That's the gospel. And that's the gospel of the grace of God that Paul was preaching. It didn't have anything to do with works. But I remember early on, and maybe I told you this before, that when I was growing up, my mother would say, if you want something, you have to work for it. And it's interesting how even from the get-go, we have this works righteousness mentality. And yet, the only work that really counts is the work of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for our sins, amen? And that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead. And as a result of that, we now have new life in Christ and it's for eternity. It's not just something where people hope so. How many people do you know? It's almost like they've got their fingers crossed. Superstitions, things that they've been taught. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's as simple as that. We just have to believe it. And then once we believe it, we have to internalize that and take it to heart to tell other people about Jesus and how much he loves them as well and how he died for them, that they too can have eternal life. Again, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. I'm kind of jumping around here, but in verses 25 to 27, Paul said, And behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. That was Paul's heart, not only to tell him the message of salvation, but to declare the whole counsel of God, cover to cover, Genesis through Revelation. Maybe you've heard me say this before, but I think it bears repeating. If you take a look at the whole counsel of God, there are only four verses of scripture, four chapters of scripture in the Bible where all is well. Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22. Everything else in between is a mess. In Genesis, it's called thorns and thistles. Some of you know that I even wrote a book called When Thorns Remain about thorns that I've had for a lot of years, but how God's grace has carried me through them. That doesn't mean that I don't hurt because I do. That doesn't mean that I don't question because I do. That doesn't mean that I, I haven't wondered why God hasn't taken care of it. But then I remember the Apostle Paul who asked three times that the Lord would take away his thorns. And each time, God said no, but God also said, my grace is sufficient for you. That's why Paul was so excited about the grace of God. I think I mentioned before that he mentioned the word grace 83 times in his 16 letters or 13 letters, I can't remember which it was. But 83 times he talked about the grace of God. And the interesting thing about it is 
That was to counter the works righteousness mentality that he grew up with, that many of them grew up with in Judaism, and that many of our family and friends have grown up with today. They don't understand grace. All they understand is works and this hope so mentality that I hope I've done enough that maybe, maybe God will let me in. But we know that our belief in Jesus gives us eternal life. And so it's not a hope so mentality, it's a no so mentality based on what God says in his word. There's something here I have I wanted to read as kind of an example of things that are going on today in our world. This is a headline from Yahoo News. Yahoo! All right, here's a poll. Nearly six in 10 Republicans say they will not vote for any candidate who admits Biden won fair and square. If you're thinking a lot about Joe Biden, I hope you're praying for him. Because if you're thinking about him too much, then you've lost track. The interesting thing about it is, and again, this is based on scripture and we find it in Daniel chapter two, God raises up kings, God takes them down. God has raised up Joe Biden to be the president of the United States and the word of God says we are to pray for him. What do you mean pray for him? The guy doesn't know what to say, and when he says things, he says them so dumb and crazy. He shouldn't even be the president of the United States. Let me tell you something. If God wanted him out of there, he'd take him down in a heartbeat. He has him there for a reason. So we're to pray for him. Let me remind you again, this is not heaven. Not even close. And again, all you have to do is watch the news and you'll know for sure this is not heaven, not even close. But Jesus is coming. We need to be excited about that. We need to be about what I call the five W's, watching, waiting, working, witnessing for, and walking with Jesus until he comes. And all three of those you can find in the Bible. So, are you watching for him? Should be. Should be excited about the prospect that he could come at any time. Then are you waiting for him? I don't know how many people say, you know, I, I, I hope he would hurry up and get here. You know, in other words, that's very selfish, isn't it? So I can go home and leave everybody else left behind for what's going to happen, which Jesus called the worst time in human history, and then an eternity in hell. No. We've still got work to do. So we're watching, we're waiting, we're working. I think the King James says, occupy until I come. And the interesting thing about it is, I looked that up in the Greek, and it means do business. In other words, go about the Lord's business until he comes, or until he calls you home watching, waiting, working, and witnessing for. Why is it that believers have a hard time witnessing to people? Because they're often rejected, and they don't like that. Well, let me tell you that Jesus was rejected too, and Paul was rejected big time. And the sufferings of what they went through are nothing compared to the sufferings that we have today. But they did it. They even went to their crosses, some of them. And as I've said before, read Hebrews chapter 11 once in a while for you to understand a little bit about what they went through. My favorite that gets me every time when I read it, they were sawn in two. Think about that. Jesus was crucified. Think about that. It's believed that Paul and Peter were beheaded. Think about that. 
and stop, let us stop feeling sorry for ourselves and wanting Jesus to come so we can get out of this mess. We've got work to do. He's called us, he's gifted us, he's given us his Holy Spirit to live within us that provides everything that we need for this life and for godliness, the word of God says. And again, I'm preaching to myself as well. Get with it. That was a saying that a friend of mine once said his, oh, this was actually Chuck Swindoll. I think it was before his father died. He simply said to Chuck, get with it, son. I like that. Get with it, sons and daughters. Be about the Lord's work until he comes. Use the Apostle Paul as an example of the fact that he said he could do all things through Christ who strengthened him. And as a result of that, that should be our kind of an attitude as well. Paul's calling and ministry was to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And we are, we have received God's grace through faith in Christ. And not only are we saved by God's grace, but we are also sustained by God's grace. He also taught the apostle Paul that, that my grace is sufficient for all of your needs. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. God gives us saving grace, and then he also gives us sustaining grace, and basically that's all of what we need for this life. To be saved, to have eternal life, and then realize that God will pour out his grace and mercy upon us as we continue to watch, wait, work, witness, and walk with Jesus until he comes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity that uh, we have together today, which really is a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. Boy, the singing. I love the singing. Thank you for our dear brother who led us in the singing this morning. Thank you for our dear brothers who led us in communion today, reminding us of Jesus and his sacrifice upon the cross for our sins and the eternal life that we have through faith in him. Father, convict us when we sin, when we miss the mark, when we fall short, when our eyes aren't on Jesus and on the work that you've given us to do. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that when we leave here today, we will remember Jesus. We will live for Jesus. We will act like Jesus. We will speak like Jesus. And we will shine brightly for Jesus until he comes or until he calls us home. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.